If you work with large-scale applications, then it's quite likely that you'll have to deal with many concurrent open connections. A large application will usually have to deal with hundreds or thousands of concurrent connections. Benchmarks have proven that standard PostgreSQL performs well alone up to 350 transactions per second. However, when we expect more transactions that could create hundreds or thousands of processes, it is important to maintain a connection puller. In this case, a connection puller such as PG Bouncer will help to improve the performance of your system. When it comes to connection pooling, PG Bouncer is really the classic workhorse. It is rock solid and it has been around for many years. The basic idea of PG Bouncer is to save connection related costs. When a user creates a new database connection, it usually means burning a couple of hundreds kilobytes of memory. While the memory itself might not be a problem, the actual creation process of the connection could be time consuming. In the background, the postmaster performs a fork system call, which creates an address space, a file descriptor, and a copy of the memory segments as of the postmaster process. And once the client disconnects, the child process gets terminated. And this process is repeated thousands of times. Still, if you create only a couple of connections and use them, you might not even notice the time PostgreSQL needs to fork the connections. But let's take into account what a typical website does. It opens a connection, fires a handful of simple statements and disconnects. Even though creating a single connection can be barely noticed, it is still a fair amount of work compared to the common requests performed on a website. So, the less work a single connection has to do in its life, the more important the time taken to actually create the connection becomes. PG Bouncer solves this problem by placing itself between the actual database server and the heavily used application. To the application, PG Bouncer looks just like a PostgreSQL server. Internally, PG Bouncer will simply keep an array of open connections and pull them. Whenever a connection is requested by the application, PG Bouncer will take the request and assign a pull connection. The main advantage here is that PG Bouncer can quickly provide a connection to the application because the real database connection already exists behind the scenes. In short, it is some sort of proxy. In addition to this, a very low memory footprint can be observed. Users have reported a footprint that is as small as 2 kilobytes per connection. This makes PG Bouncer ideal for very large connection pools. Now that we have a basic understanding of PG Bouncer, it's time to play with it. The goal in this tutorial is to create a PG Bouncer instance that will be placed in front of a PostgreSQL instance. To start, we'll create a brand new PostgreSQL test database. Later in the tutorial, we'll execute a stress test to verify what is the gain. Normally, the association PG Bouncer Postgres database is one to one since PG Bouncer doesn't provide a load balancing feature by itself. Although PG Bouncer can help you to manage database connections, it doesn't handle multi host configurations or failover. So, PG Bouncer alone can't help for deploying Postgres with high availability. For that, we'll use PG Pool or HA Proxy load balancing capabilities along with PG Bouncer so that we could deploy a highly available system for Postgres. But that's another topic that we'll cover in other videos. Given that, when we need to access the database, we'll use PG Bouncer. It will be PG Bouncer's responsibility to create connections on PostgreSQL instance and to reuse those connections. So, in the first place, we'll create a nice and shiny test database. We'll use the initdb command tool included in the standard PostgreSQL installation to create a new PostgreSQL database cluster. initdb d and then we specify a directory where we'll store the database. Slash tmp slash test underscore db. 
To start the database, we'll use the pgctl command, minus d, and then the directory for that instance, which is tmp slash test underscore db, and start. First, we need to install pgbouncer. Depending on your operating system, you can install pgbouncer using your own package manager. For Red Hat or CentOS, you could use yum, and for Ubuntu or Debian, you could use apt-get. For Mac OS, I'll use brew. Brew install pgbouncer. Or another option is to download the sources and then build them. Since I already have pgbouncer installed, I'm not going to execute this command. To make pgbouncer work, we have to feed it with a configuration file. And to not start from scratch, we could use the sample configuration file called pgbouncer.ini. After installing pgbouncer, we should be able to see this file under the OS configuration directory. On macOS, this file is found under user slash local slash etc. On Linux systems, it's usually found under etc slash pgbouncer. This default configuration file would not serve the purpose in a real life scenarios, but it's a good point to start from. Before editing the file, we'll make a copy of it as a backup. Next, to open and edit the file, we could use the nano tool. nano pgbouncer.ini. This configuration file consists of many parameters that need to be set correctly. The first thing that we want to configure is the backend database servers we want to connect to. So, under the database section, we'll connect to the database created previously using this style format. We have an example here, which we will copy paste. Basically, this is a connection config with key value pair format. First, we'll specify an alias for this configuration and I call it test underscore db. Then, for the database name, we'll use the default database, which is Postgres. Then the host is local. The port is the default one, 5432. We won't need user and password, but we need to specify a user for authentication. PGBouncer also handles client authentication, and this is a broader subject which deserves a separate topic. For this tutorial, we'll use a simpler mechanism to log in using the authentication underscore user parameter. There is also the authentication file, which is the more traditional setup that's also more versatile if users and passwords change a lot and it's probably more robust. Also, there are possibilities to authenticate using LDAP or PAM. For this authentication, we'll need a super user, which we'll create in a second. For now, we'll specify just its name. We could call it Postgres as well. Now, we need to create that user. We connect to the database directly, psql-p 5432, and the name of the database, Postgres. Here, we'll create a dummy super user called Postgres without specifying a password. Create user, Postgres, and the flag is super user. Now that we have a basic configuration, we could start up the system. The backend database is already started, so we can proceed to start the pgbouncer. To do this, we'll call the pgbouncer command, and we must also specify the configuration file. Then, if our pgbouncer server is up and running, we could connect to the Postgres database through pgbouncer with the psql command, but using the port 6432 instead. In our example, we are connecting to the database called Postgres, but we are using the alias we defined earlier, which is testdb. And then the user is also Postgres.
we can see that the shell has opened normally and we can execute SQL queries just as if we were connected to a normal database. The log messages will also reflect our efforts to connect to the database and the state. For each connection, we get various log entries so that administrators could easily check what is going on. In the previous section, we saw some of the mandatory settings necessary so that PG Bouncer could start. But performance is one of the key factors when considering PG Bouncer in the first place. To make sure that performance stays high, some issues have to be taken seriously. As we already stated, the idea of PG Bouncer is to speed up the process of getting a database connection. But what will happen if there are no spare database connection that are idle. Then PG Bouncer will spend a lot of time making new connections ready. To fix this problem, it is recommended to set the parameter min underscore pool underscore size to a reasonable value. This is especially important if many connections are created at the same time. For example, when a web server is restarted. So make sure that your pool is reasonably sized to sustain high performance in terms of creating new connections. nano pgbouncer.ini control w to search min underscore pool and here we should change the value. To figure out what value to set, we could check out the pgbouncer statistics to see how many connections are normally in the pool. Then we should also configure some upper limits. First, the default underscore pool underscore size setting is per user and per database. Therefore, in this case, every user can have maximum 20 connections. After that, PG Bouncer will put the user in a wait queue for extra connections. But then, how many requests can we put in the queue? We have the max client connections parameter to configure how many additional slots we have for the wait queue. This is used mainly to prevent clients from waiting too long on the queue before being assigned a connection. Of course, these settings only restricts the PG Bouncer clients and don't affect clients that go directly to PostgreSQL. Last but not least, it is recommended to make sure that all nodes participating in your setup are fairly close to each other. This greatly helps reducing network time and thus boost the performance. There is no point in reducing the overhead of calling fork on a PostgreSQL instance and paying for this gain with network time. Just as in most scenarios, reducing network time and latency is definitely a huge benefit. Pool modes are quite important, so we have dedicated a separate section for them. PG Bouncer understands PostgreSQL protocol very well and it allows us to choose three connections modes based on different needs. First, we have the session mode, which is the default. In this case, a PostgreSQL connection is reserved to a client until the client disconnects. This is considered to be the safest method. However, greedy applications can take over the limited connections by never freeing them. Then we have the transaction mode. In this case, a connection is reserved to a client until he completes a single transaction. Once the transaction is either committed or aborted, the connection re-enters the pool and is assigned to another client. This is a good setting to use for applications that insist on holding persistent database connection. Unfortunately, some applications that use cursors or pagination expect connections to persist between transactions. Since in this mode, the connection is reset between every transaction, these cursors are also deallocated and the application will not function normally. The third pooling option statement allows us to return a connection back to the pool immediately at the end of the statement. This is a highly aggressive setting and has basically been designed to serve high concurrency setups in which transactions are not relevant at all. 
To make sure that nothing can go wrong in this setup, long transactions spanning more than one statement are not allowed. Until now, we have highlighted that it's very beneficial to use PG Bouncer if many short-lived connections have to be created by an application. To prove our point, we have prepared a somewhat extreme example. The goal is to run a test that does as little actual work as possible, but which opens a connection for each request. Basically, we'll execute the following command in a loop. So, first, we have to save this query in a SQL file. To create an empty file, we'll use the touch command. And then nano to add the query. Select one. We save the file. We want to measure how much time we spend to open the connections with or without PG Bouncer. To actually run a big load test, we'll use PG Bench, a module which is widely used to benchmark PostgreSQL. This module is also installed together with PostgreSQL. First, we should initialize the database to be ready for the benchmark. So, PG Bench and the database is Postgres. Then, to actually execute the benchmark, PG Bench minus C20, we want to run 20 concurrent clients or users and they all execute 1000 single transactions. First, we'll execute the benchmark directly on the PostgreSQL database, so minus S Postgres. The minus C option indicates that for every single transaction, the benchmark will close the open connection and create a new one. This could be considered a typical case on a web server without pooling. Each page might be a separate connection. Then minus F, and then we specify the script that we created previously, and the port is 5432. So, if we have to fork a connection each time, we could execute just 309 transactions per second. Now, let's repeat the test and connect to PostgreSQL through PG Bouncer. First, we start the PG Bouncer, then PG Bench with 20 clients with 1000 transactions each. For the database, we'll use the alias test underscore db, then minus c to open a new connection for each request, then we execute the same script. And now the port is 6432. As you can see, our throughput has risen to more than 4000 transactions per second. This is many more times than before and indeed a nice gain. Also, the average connection time is just 0.23 milliseconds instead of 3.21 milliseconds. Therefore, this kind of overhead is worth thinking about.